This is Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'm going to help you better understand the Adrenal Stress Index Test, which is a saliva-based test from the company Diagnostics, and I'll also discuss how to address some of the more common imbalances found on an adrenal saliva test. If you have used a different company for your adrenal saliva test, you will still find a lot of this information to be beneficial. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main purpose of these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand the test results so that they can find or remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. I need to let you know that this video is not meant to be used as medical advice or as a recommended treatment protocol, and it isn't a replacement for consulting with a competent healthcare practitioner. Before going over the Adrenal Stress Index report, I think it's important to briefly discuss why anyone should consider saliva testing. First of all, saliva testing is easy and non-invasive. Saliva testing also looks at the free or active form of the hormone. Unlike blood testing, saliva testing allows you to collect multiple samples in a single day. And the reason why collecting multiple samples is important is because cortisol follows a circadian rhythm as it should be high in the morning and low at the end of the day. And we'll see an example of this shortly. Some are concerned about whether saliva testing is as accurate as blood tests. And the truth is that blood testing can be important, but when it comes to evaluating the adrenals, the research shows that saliva testing is just as accurate as blood tests. And of course, the main advantage is the ability to look at the circadian rhythm of cortisol. So let's take a look at the actual report. And we'll start off by looking at the cortisol levels. So cortisol works according to circadian rhythm. And so it should be at the highest in the morning and at the lowest level at the end of the day. And we see this here as the morning cortisol is 20 and then it gradually decreases throughout the day and it's at its lowest value at night. And you can also see this in graph form in figure one. So the way this works is that the person collects four different saliva samples throughout the day with the first sample being collected upon waking up in the morning. And for most people, that means between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. The second sample is collected between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. The third sample is collected between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. And the fourth and final sample is collected between 10 p.m. and midnight. For more information on collecting saliva samples, please be on the lookout for another video that focuses on this topic. And here we see the total cortisol output. Um, so this is the sum of all four cortisol values. And you can see that in this example, it is 36, which is within the reference range. So if we scroll down to figure two, we can see the inducers of cortisol release. So these are the factors which can lead to the secretion of cortisol. Blood sugar imbalances are one factor with hypoglycemic states given in this example. Um, so this in turn affects ACTH which is secreted by the pituitary gland, and this in turn stimulates adrenals to secrete cortisol. So tissue damage here caused by inflammation, illness, or an infection can also affect ACTH, which in turn leads to cortisol secretion. Mental and emotional stressors can cause a sympathetic response, which in turn affects ACTH and can cause cortisol secretion. So essentially blood sugar, tissue damage, and stress can affect cortisol secretion. And then over here, you can see factors that affect the circadian rhythm, including one's sleep patterns, light, dark exposure, and meal times. So for example, if you sleep in a room that is not completely dark at night, this can have a negative effect on your circadian rhythm. So now that you've seen what cortisol should look like on an adrenal saliva panel, let's discuss what to do if cortisol is too low or too high. Just a quick reminder that we want to address the cause of the high or low cortisol levels, if at all possible. Of course, you want to incorporate diet and lifestyle factors in order to improve your adrenal health, which will greatly help to normalize your cortisol levels. Sometimes taking nutritional supplements and our herbs can also help to address high cortisol. Just remember that they're not a substitute for diet and lifestyle factors. Phosphatidylserine can benefit some people with high cortisol levels, as can adaptogenic herbs such as ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is a member of the nightshade family, and so if you're trying to avoid nightshades, it probably is best to avoid ashwagandha. One can also take nutritional supplements and our herbs for low cortisol levels. Keep in mind that if someone has a condition such as Addison's disease, then taking nutritional supplements and herbs will have a minimal effect on the person. Licorice root can help to increase cortisol. 
although it can also increase blood pressure, which is why anyone with high blood pressure needs to be cautious about taking this herb. The B vitamins and vitamin C can also help to support cortisol production. I can't say that I commonly recommend adrenal glandulars to my patients, although many practitioners will give them regularly, and I would just advise you not to take them longer than two months to avoid becoming dependent on them. I need to warn you that exposure or contamination from corticosteroids or progesterone can falsely elevate cortisol levels. So let's go ahead and look at DHEA on the report. You can see that the adult reference range is between 3 and 10 nanograms per milliliter, and this person has a value of 6, which is great. If someone has a DHEA of 1 or 2, then it will be red flagged as being depressed. But I also want to mention that if DHEA is a 3 on this report, it will be red flagged as borderline low. And of course, anything above 10 will be red flagged as being elevated. So to the right, we see figure 3, which shows the cortisol DHEA correlation. In this example, the person is in the reference, uh, reference zone, the reference range, uh, which means that they display a relative balance in average cortisol and DHA values. On the other hand, if someone had high cortisol and low DHA, um, they would be in zone 3, which is over here. Um, whereas if both cortisol and DHA were depressed, um, then they would fall in zone 8. And... Here we see adrenal hypofunction, low cortisol, DH, low DHA. Again, that would be zone 8. Now, to be honest, I don't pay much attention to the different zones here as I mainly focus on the individual cortisol and DHA levels. So DHA is mostly secreted by the adrenal glands, specifically in the adrenal cortex. And here you can see some of the different functions of DHA. So how would you address depressed DHA levels? Well, since a low DHA is usually caused by chronic stress, doing things to improve your stress handling skills would be a start. Supporting the overall health of the adrenals can also help. For example, in the past I had low cortisol levels and a low DHEA, and I chose not to take DHEA, but instead I focused on improving my adrenal health through diet, stress management, getting sufficient sleep. I also took some nutritional supplements and herbs to support my adrenals, and this not only helped to normalize my cortisol levels, but also help to normalize my DHEA. And I've seen the same thing with many of my patients over the years. So what causes high DHEA levels? Well, some of the different factors which can cause elevated DHEA levels include um, polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, hypothyroidism, elevated prolactin levels, which is hyperprolactinemia, um, something called non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, rarely tumors, Cushing syndrome, and acromegaly, as well as exposure and contamination issues. As for how to address elevated DHA levels, you of course want to address the cause of the problem whenever possible. For example, if someone has high prolactin levels, then they obviously will want to address this. If PCOS is a factor, then this needs to be addressed. The next marker on this test is insulin. The reason why insulin is included on this test is because insulin activity is affected by the stress response and chronic stress can actually lead to insulin resistance in some cases. If you look at the reference ranges, you'll see that fasting insulin is considered to be elevated when the value is greater than 11 and borderline elevated between 3 and 11. Non-fasting insulin is considered elevated when greater than 25 and borderline elevated between 6 and 25. And so in this example, both fasting and non-fasting insulin are normal. Although the adrenal stress index test looks at insulin, I wouldn't rely on this single marker in order to determine if someone has blood sugar imbalances. I would consider doing blood testing as in addition to doing a fasting insulin um, and or glucose in the blood, you could also test for hemoglobin A1C, uh, which is the average glucose levels over two to four months. Um, as for how to address insulin resistance, while some people will need to take prescription medications such as metformin, the two big keys is to eliminate refined foods and sugars and to reduce inflammation. Supplementation might be considered at times, and a few examples of things that can help include gymnema, cinnamon, berberine, as well as chromium. So how do you address hypoglycemia? Well, diet also plays a key role, and improving the health of the adrenals is also essential. Food sensitivities can also be a factor in hypoglycemia. Next, we'll take a look at 17-OH progesterone or 17-hydroxyprogesterone, 
which is not the same as regular progesterone. So if you take a look at the adrenal steroid synthesis pathway on the right, you'll see that 17-hydroxyprogesterone is in between progesterone and cortisol. And so it's a precursor to cortisol. And we can see that the optimal range is between 22 and 100 picograms per milliliter. And while 28 is within this range, it's on the low side, as I like to see this value above 40. So once again, 17-hydroxyprogesterone is not the same as progesterone, as it is a precursor to cortisol. If 17-hydroxyprogesterone is high, this can be due to taking progesterone, but it could also be due to a deficiency of the 21-hydroxylase enzyme. In the latter situation, this can be related to something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an inherited condition. Lower depressed 17-hydroxyprogesterone is usually seen when someone has compromised adrenals. In the specific report I've been covering, the person's adrenals actually aren't too bad, and so perhaps they're in the beginning stages of having compromised adrenals. Here we see total salivary SIGA, also known as secretory IgA, which lines the mucosa surfaces of the body, especially the gastrointestinal tract. One of the main functions of secretory IgA is preventing antigens, such as food particles and bacteria, from entering the body. So it's a form of protection. If you look at the reference range, you'll see that the normal range is between 10 and 20 milligrams per deciliter. And this person is within the normal range, although on the high side at 20. So let's talk about what causes a low and high secretory IgA and how to address these. So one of the main causes of a low secretory IgA is chronic stress, although food allergens and infections can also be a cause. One thing I didn't put on this slide is that it's also possible to have an inherited immunoglobulin A deficiency, although this is rare. I also should mention that a low secretory IgA usually correlates with an increase in intestinal permeability, which is also known as a leaky gut. As for how to address a low or depressed secretory IgA, you of course want to manage stress and support the gut through diet and or supplementation. If a food allergen or infection is a culprit, then of course this needs to be addressed. Some foods which can support gut healing include bone broth and cabbage juice, and some people can benefit from taking L-glutamine, aloe vera, slippery elm, marshmallow roots, Saccharomyces boulardii, as well as vitamin A. So let's go ahead and discuss some factors that can cause a high secretory IgA. Inflammation from infections or a food allergen is a common cause, but when talking about inflammation, we need to keep in mind that the inflammation can be coming from anywhere, including the mouth, the gut, or general inflammation. So you'll see here in parentheses, I listed HSCRP, which stands for a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And sometimes when someone has an elevated secretory IgA, they'll also have an elevated HSCRP in the blood, although this isn't always the case. An acute stress response can cause a mild elevation of secretory IgA. So how do you address elevated secretory IgA? Well, of course you need to find and address the cause of this elevated secretory IgA. And I know this is easier said than done at times, but if someone has inflammation that is causing an increase in secretory IgA, then the source of the inflammation needs to be identified and then addressed. The last marker on the adrenal stress index test is the gluten or gliadin antibodies. Gliadins are found in grains such as wheat, rye, and barley, and they can trigger an immune reaction in some individuals. I must admit that this isn't my favorite marker on this test, and the reason for this is because a negative result does not rule out adverse reactions to gluten. In addition, patients who have been on a strict gluten-free diet for three months or longer are expected to have a negative result, and the reason for this is because you need to be eating gluten in order to produce gluten antibodies. So here we'll see this person is negative, which is great, but it doesn't completely rule out celiac disease or a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So let's quickly summarize this marker. As you now know where gliadins are found, and you also know that a negative result does not rule out celiac disease or a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And if you have been strictly avoiding gluten for a while, you should expect this marker to be negative. Also, if secretory IgA is low, then this can cause a false negative. If you are eating gluten, if you want to find out if you're reacting to gluten, probably the best test out there as of now is the Ray 3 from Cyrex Labs, as this currently is the most comprehensive test for evaluating an immune system response to gluten. Now that I've gone through the Adrenal Stress Index test report, 
you might be wondering when is adrenal saliva testing necessary to do? I recommend adrenal saliva testing to most of my patients. Here are some of the indications for doing adrenal saliva testing. Since most people have adrenal problems, you might wonder if you can just assume you have problems with your adrenals and bypass this test. Perhaps you could just take some general adrenal support. The problem with this approach is that different adrenal imbalances require different treatments. For example, when I did my first adrenal saliva test years ago, it revealed that I had depressed cortisol levels, a depressed DHEA, a depressed 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and a depressed secretory IgA. But from a symptomatic standpoint, I didn't feel too bad. And while modifying diet and lifestyle factors won't hurt regardless of what your test looks like, the specific nutritional or herbal support will differ depending on your findings. So I do think it's a good idea to evaluate the adrenals. If you found this video to be valuable, please click on the like button below. And to get the latest videos to help you better understand your test results, make sure you subscribe right now and ring that notification bell. And I'll catch you in the next video.